In this section of training, we'll explore the topic of handwriting. We'll begin by providing a summary of what research tells us about the importance of handwriting, go over some important foundational skills, and how to support students that are developing those foundational skills. We also provide some brief tips on how to directly teach formation of a new letter. There will be a couple of brief procedure demonstrations included in this section of training. I'd like to begin by sharing some research on the importance of handwriting and how it affects students academically. One of the first things I'd like to do is draw a comparison between reading fluency in comprehension and writing fluency in composition. In reading fluency, we understand that students must be able to accurately and automatically decode text so that they can focus their mental energy on making sense of what they've read. In handwriting, students need to be able to form letters accurately, automatically, and legibly enough so that they can focus their mental energy on composition and communicating their ideas. Students that struggle with handwriting may have difficulty with the following tasks. They may not be able to complete written tasks in a timely manner. They may be easily fatigued in activities involving writing. They may have a difficult time writing legibly enough for themselves or others to be able to go back and read what was written. Or they may struggle with note-taking because that involves a level of automaticity and rate and legibility to be able to go back and utilize notes later. Also, students with handwriting difficulty tend to struggle with adding sufficient detail in their compositions because handwriting is so labor-intensive. Throughout this section of training, we'll reference handwriting instruction from two perspectives, preventative and corrective. Preventative instruction in manuscript formations typically begins in kindergarten, once some foundational skills have been established. We'll talk more about foundational skills in a moment. Preventative instruction may also involve teaching cursive writing in upper grades. Corrective instruction, however, is instruction that's provided on letters or formations and addressing habits that students have developed poorly. Regardless of what the approach is, preventative or corrective, research tells us that small doses of 5 to 10 minutes a day is more effective than longer blocks of time. In this video, we'll discuss tools for supporting instruction, the importance of the readiness skills, and how to support students in developing those if they're not yet established, as well as scope and sequence options and the process for explicitly teaching a letter. In terms of giving students appropriate tools, let's start off by exploring writing utensils. Oftentimes, we think about writing utensils being very age or grade level specific. We need to be open to the fact that students are unique and may have different needs or comfort levels when holding a utensil. For instance, while those fat red pencils tend to be our go-to in kindergarten and first grade, it may be more comfortable for some smaller hands to use those smaller golf-sized pencils. In regard to how lightly some students write when perhaps a number two pencil isn't showing up, giving students a number one pencil with softer lead would be more appropriate, or even a pen. Another option for students who write lightly would be a felt-tip pen. Making sure that we give students some options and encourage them to make a selection that is comfortable for them is important. Another tool to consider is paper. Lined paper comes in many different sizes and varying options. For example, lines could be different colors and thicknesses, and spaces between lines could be narrow or wide. We might even have raised lines to give kids some tactile feedback on boundaries as to whether they're going too far above or below the line. When we're choosing paper, we need to keep in mind that there is no age level or grade level specific paper. Instead, we need to consider making paper options available to students and helping them select the option that works best for them. For example, we tend to think about wider lined paper being appropriate for young students. But if you think about how that might feel proportionately, that would be similar to adults writing a memo on a chalkboard or a dry erase board. After a while, your hand becomes fatigued and your legibility might be compromised because you're having to draw or form these letters with larger strokes. 
So instead of forcing younger students toward wide-lined paper and older students toward narrow-lined paper, be flexible in allowing them to choose the option that feels best for them. When using lined paper, be consistent about your terminology. As a school, if you decide that the terminology should be basement, window, ceiling, then the expectation is everyone uses that terminology with their students. Otherwise, if different terminology is used, students will be confused about where letters should begin and end. Another thing to keep in mind is that unlined paper may be a great choice for students who are early in their instruction. By using unlined paper, students can focus their attention on the actual letter formation and directionality and not have to be concerned about spacing or placement on lines. Let's shift our attention now to readiness skills. One of the very first things we need to do with students is make sure that they have established hand dominance. In this age of technology and gaming, we're finding that more and more students are entering school without establishing left-handed or right-handedness. When we find this to be the case, we might want to do a quick assessment with students to help them identify if they have a preferred hand and then help them develop a habit for using that for all written activities in school. One quick and easy way to do this hand dominance assessment is to provide students with several objects and tasks. Provide quick directions such as, please pick up the marker and put it on the table, or drop all the yellow items into this box. With every direction that you provide, make a tally note on your paper regarding which hand they used. Hopefully, you'll have students with one hand that is used noticeably more than the other. Once that happens, tell students that that should be their writing hand and encourage them to use that consistently. Another important readiness skill to develop is directionality. In English, we read and write left to right, top to bottom. Most letters are formed the same way, left to right or top to bottom. To help students understand this directionality, there are many different activities that we can use to get that muscle memory going. Just as from a reading perspective, we work on print concepts of tracking text left to right and top to bottom, we want them to understand that text is written left to right, top to bottom. On the next slide, you'll see a couple of activities that we might use to help students develop this muscle memory. On the screen are some example activities that we may use. You'll see that there is a series of lines with different formations and an object at the end of the line. By having students trace with a pencil or marker, or even draw with a matchbox car or object across the line, we're helping them move from left to right and build that muscle memory. These activities can be done at the teacher table or at an independent workstation to get that tracking and muscle memory going. The next readiness skill we'll explore is pencil grip. In order for students to form letters correctly, they need to have proper pencil grip. Without correct pencil grip, they lack the control and stability to be able to form letters. There are two quick methods that can be used and practiced in a class setting so that the teacher does not have to walk around the room and check pencil grip individually. We'll demonstrate that in a quick video. I'm going to demonstrate a couple of pencil grips that you can use with your students. The first one is called the pinch and flip. And the way you do this is you have your students put their pencil on the table with the writing end pointing to their belly button. Then with their thumb and their index finger, they're going to pinch their pencil and then flip and the pencil will rest here in the fatty part of the hand and your middle finger will come on up under the pencil and support it. So that's called pinch and flip. If you have a student that is not sure where to pinch, you can put tape on the pencil and it's easy to take off when the pencil gets shorter. The next one is the tripod method. With the tripod method, you're going to have your students hold the pencil in their non-writing hand with the point on the surface of the table, and then they're going to take their three first three fingers, their thumb, their index, and middle, and they're going to slide it down the pencil and then lift. 
and then everything should be in place. So those are two methods. Let me go through those again. So pinch and flip, and then the tripod. Being able to control the pressure from the pencil to the paper is another important readiness skill. Some students squeeze the pencil so tightly in their hand that their muscles become fatigued. Others push hard on the pencil and their lead continues to break or their paper tears. Some others have the opposite problem and they barely push hard enough and their writing is faint and difficult to read. In the next segment, we'll demonstrate a couple of quick tips that might offer students help in getting the appropriate pressure. I'm going to share a couple of tips with you right now to help students that grip their pencils too hard and they put too much pressure. One of them is called the magic bracelet. Now, anytime you add magic to anything, it makes it so much more special. So with the magic bracelet, the students will put the bracelet on their wrist. They'll grab their pencil in whatever grip they use, and then they'll take the magic bracelet and put it over the pencil, and that pulls that pencil back into this fatty part of the hand, and that way it relieves some of that squeezing up here at the top, and so that helps them not to put so much pressure. The other one is you can use a cotton ball or a pom-pom or something small and soft, and they have to hold it in their hand then they grip their pencil like they normally do. And again, that's also gonna relieve that pressure and they're not going to um, squeeze as hard on, with their uh, pencil. So those are two easy, inexpensive tips that you can share with kids that are um, using too much pressure when they're writing. The last tip we want to offer for readiness is paper placement. Making sure that students have their paper anchored on their tabletop in the right position will support correct letter formation. Students who are right-handed should have the upper right-hand corner of their paper slightly elevated. Students who are left-handed should have the left corner of their paper slightly elevated. Some left-handed students do find it more comfortable to have their paper completely straight. What students need to do with their non-writing hand is anchor their paper and hold it in place while their writing hand is writing. Students who have a difficult time getting correct placement might benefit from having a piece of tape on their desktop to help them line up the top of their paper. Sometimes a clipboard will help anchor paper. Just be sure that the metal piece of the clipboard is positioned in a way that is not obstructing their hand or limiting their movement. When considering a scope and sequence for handwriting instruction, consider whether your approach is preventative for younger students or corrective for older students. In foundational instruction, research suggests teaching students how to form a letter at the same time that they're learning that letter for identification and sound symbol correspondence. If you're using our kindergarten and first grade lesson plans, you'll see that this is our perspective in handwriting as well. For instance, when students are learning letter recognition of A, and that A makes the sound A, ah, they're also learning, in that same lesson, how to form the letter A explicitly. By directly teaching handwriting in these grades, we are helping to prevent bad habits that will interfere with written expression. Another important point when entering into a scope and sequence for younger students who are at the foundational level of instruction is that it's critical to separate letters that are easily confused from a visual perspective. For example, we would not want to teach lowercase b and lowercase d in close proximity. They have very similar visual attributes, and students confuse them. The same would be true with n and m and V and W. We also want to consider separating letters that have similar sounds. For example, M and N are very similar in sound and therefore should be separated in our scope and sequence. It is also important when making scope and sequence decisions to give priority instruction to lowercase letters. This is true for preventative instruction as well as corrective. We teach lowercase letters first and emphasize accurate and automatic formation because they make up more than 97% of written text. These are the letters students will see the most. 
They're the letters they will write the most. Therefore, students need more support in developing good handwriting skills of these lower case letters. When considering corrective instruction for older students, it may be better to group letters together with similar strokes. Here is an example of a possible instructional grouping tool. On the top row, you see letters that are grouped together because they're discontinuous. This involves forming a portion of the letter, having students pick up their pencil, and form another portion of the letter. These are letters that cannot be formed with one continuous stroke. Whereas, looking at the second row, we have donut letters. These are all letters that have the same starting point. C starting just below the line and going around. When you form the letter O, you're building the same stroke as you did with C. All of these letters are formed with the same starting place and similar stroke sequence. So, for students who need corrective instruction, this is a good way to support that muscle memory by working on letters that have similar strokes. When shifting our instruction to capital letters, we suggest eliminating direct instruction of capital letters that match their lowercase forms. For example, capital C, capital O, and capital X match their lowercase forms, and all we may need to do for students is just direct them to a different starting point when forming the letter. Explicit direction on formation strokes in order and sequence of letter formation may not be necessary. Instead, it may be more important to focus on direct instruction of the capital letters that don't match their lowercase buddies. That way, students have that explicit instruction in muscle memory. For example, letters such as capital B, capital G, etc. When introducing students to the correct formation for a new letter, we offer the following tips. 1. Begin with gross motor activities so that you can eliminate the obstacles and challenges that some students face with pencil grip and appropriate pressure. Second, we suggest using an auditory script to help students remember the appropriate stroke sequence for forming the letter. Remember that muscle memory is strong, and if we can support students in the correct procedure for forming the letter, we can deal with spacing and placement on lines down the road. On the screen is a sample script for introducing the new letter, lowercase h. Notice on the left that the teacher is explaining the steps and providing students with that auditory script we referenced. In the third box down where the script kicks in, the teacher says, start at the top, pull down, back up to the middle, and make a hump. This idea of giving the script and having students practice that stroke formation while articulating the steps makes this an even more beneficial multi-sensory tool for them. When they're forming the letter on their own, if their muscle memory doesn't kick in, hopefully their auditory memory will, to support them with the directionality and sequence of strokes. Now we will go over a brief demonstration of how this process looks through all of the different stages. Today we're going to practice making the letter H. And when we make the letter H, we start at the top. Where do we start? At the top. Good. So listen to me as I say this script and trace the letter. Start at the top, pull down, back to the middle, and make a hump. So I want you to say that with me as I trace. And start, start at, at the, the top, top pull, pull down, down Back to the middle, make a hump. Now, I want you to sky ride it, so get that stro those straight, strong arms. And where are we starting again? At the top. Good job. So start, start at the, the top, top, pull down, back to the middle, and make, make a hump. hump. Start at the top, pull down, back to the middle, make a hump. Start at the top, pull down, back to the middle, make a hump. Good job. And now you have your own template and I want you to trace on that, and you're gonna do that three times as you say the script. Start at the top, pull down, back to the middle, make a hump. Start at the top, pull down, back to the middle, make a hump. Start at the top, pull down, back to the middle, make a hump. Very nice. Now I'm gonna show you how to make the letter H on your paper. So we're gonna use this little robot man. 
So if you look at his head, his head is touching the top line. And then this is his, his belly, and that's the dotted line. And then his feet are touching the bottom line. So when we make the letter H, where do we start? At the top. At the top. So start at the top, pull down, and we're going to go all the way to the bottom where his feet are. Back up to the middle, that's that dotted line, make a hump, and come back to the bottom again. So we're going to start at the top, top pull, pull down, down, back to the middle, make a hump. Start at the top, pull down, back to the middle, make a hump. And now I'm going to have you write on your paper three times the letter H as you say that script. Okay. Start at the top, pull down, back to the middle, make a hump. Start at the top pull down, back to the middle, make a hump. Start at the top, pull down, back to the middle, make a hump. Very nice, good job. There are many different resources available to teachers to support students with auditory scripts for letter formation. We've included one in your manual for reference. One thing to consider as you're choosing formation scripts is that you may need to alter the script slightly. Make sure that the references to lines are consistent with the terminology that you use, and whether you're using standard manuscript or Danelian. This concludes the handwriting portion of training.